uh, as we get going here. Uh, but we do have uh, a lot of material to cover, and we certainly want to give everybody time to ask questions. So, um, what uh, I, I wanted to first thank everybody for taking the time to attend this today, um, our first uh, virtual water quality summit. Uh, there are, I guess, some silver linings in. Uh, this recent COVID event, uh, and one of them is figuring out how to connect with our customers virtually. Um, we certainly miss seeing our customers and partners in person. Uh, this event is going to, we're going to walk uh, all of our customers and our consumers through our annual water quality report, um, which really, it's a summary of the water sampling uh, that we do with our uh, water source providers and through our uh, distribution and storage systems. So we're going to be hitting on all of that at a, a pretty high level um, and certainly will uh, allow the you know, lots of questions at the end um, to go into greater detail um, for those that would like. Uh, the format today is going to, like I said, start at this high level, um, but there will be some technical information. Um, and so uh, if you have some questions around uh, some of the technical information we provide, we're going to ask that you hold your questions um, during the presentation, but please feel free to type your questions into the chat um, as uh, we go through the presentation. Um, we ask that you please mute your microphones. Um, so, I, I, in fact, I can hear somebody right now. So, um, if you haven't muted your microphone, please mute your microphone. Uh, it makes it a lot easier on our presenters. Um, and remain muted uh, until the question and answer period. And at that point, uh, we will have that part of the discussion be moderated. So, when we call on you, you can unmute, ask your question, and then make sure you, you mute your microphone after you ask the question. Um, Tualatin Valley Water District, we are a public agency, so the recording of this meeting is a public record. Uh, so please understand that, that um, everything uh, you say here is going to be recorded. Um, if you experience technical difficulties such as audio, speed, or video pixeling, um, try turning off your video to lower the bandwidth on the event. Sometimes that helps uh, if you just go to just audio um, if you need to do that. Uh, so today's presentations uh, are going to be provided by Joel Carey, Water Resources Division Manager. Joel oversees the water sampling program at Tualatin Valley Water District. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joel to take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, it's kind of a new thing for us, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get through this and we're excited that you're all joining us today. Hopefully learn a little bit more about water quality. Hear all of your questions you might have, um, anything's on the table at the end. And uh, as Tom noted, we're going to try and go through our, our consumer conference report, our annual report this year as best as possible. You know, keep it at a high level, but also go into some details as needed along the way. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Bear with me one second here while we get this teed up. So hopefully, one second here. So thumbs up. Can everybody see that? Yes, looks good. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, at TVWD, uh, we start every meeting, board meeting, internal meetings with a safety moment. Um, it's an important part of the culture of TVWD, and we like to promote that here. So today's uh, safety moment, either fortunately or unfortunately, depending on whether or not you've come in contact with this before, is about poison oak. Um, we just wanted to highlight that as people are probably being more active this time of year. 
uh, going outside, hiking, you know, doing yard work. Um, so again, be mindful. There's a couple examples of what poison oak looks like. Either some new spring growth or some established or exposed growth. Um, and there's a funny little ditty up there up top, a little rhyme that hopefully you can remember. Um, leaves of three, let it be. If it's hairy, it's a berry. And if it's shiny, watch your hiney. Um, I can speak from experience that it's not fun having poison oak. So if you see any of those telltale signs, be sure to uh, be sure to stay away. A couple of tips you can do to protect yourself is wear the right type of clothing when you're out hiking, brush clearing, etc. Uh, long sleeves, pants, anything you can. And if you do come in contact with it, um, do your best to wash those those that that clothing. Any of your exposed skin within 30 minutes, uh, even your pet sometimes, that oil is pretty pervasive, so it can last quite a while, uh, up to a year or longer on clothing or other items. So just be mindful of that, you know, and sometimes symptoms take several days to occur. And if you do um, you get symptoms, you have swelling, extreme rash, trouble breathing, or, or possible infection, make sure you seek medical attention. So a little, a little side note related to work, uh, I actually came into contact with Poison Oak up on Cooper Mountain. For, for those of you that do live in that area, be aware that it does exist up there. All right, now on to the main topic, the Water Quality Forum. Again, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, we're going to kind of go over a quick little overview and just talk about some of today's goals for just a brief second. So within the presentation, we're going to kind of go through from source to tap. We'll explain some of the the way that the reports laid out again from constituents that we look at in the source all the way to the tap um, some examples and some a quick little video of how we monitor the water and then we'll do a breakdown of the actual report just to kind of give you a sense and idea of exactly where this data comes from and and how we sort of aggregate it together and some key key things to remember when you're going through this report and then we're going to spend most of our time today with the q a session um, honestly today was really trying to make sure that we gave folks the chance to see the context around the report and have the ability to ask us is ask any questions you might like about the report uh, high level all the way to the most technical thing that you might be interested in so a couple of today's goals um frankly we're here to help if you have questions and you want more detail that's what we're here for so we want to make sure we're transparent just giving you information about all the work that's gone on to make sure that your water is safe to drink um, providing you context like i mentioned answering your questions and ultimately, we really hope that today you, you take away that um, your water is safe to drink. So we really want to highlight that throughout this process. There's a lot of work that goes into that, and some of that work includes you as well. So those are the goals for today. So just a really quick recap, TVWD is really fortunate to have three high quality sources of water. Um, they're the Portland Water Bureau. We purchased part of our water supply from, from the Bureau. That includes surface and groundwater supplies. Uh, Joint Water Commission, that's our partnership with TBWD, City of Hillsborough, City of Beaverton, and Forest Grove. Um, that consists of uh, the upper portion of the Twilton River watershed, and then TBWD's own aquifer storage and recovery. Uh, that is effectively us taking treated drinking water. We store it in the ground when water is more plentiful during the winter time, uh, so we can pump it back out in the summer when uh, to meet some of our peak demands. Uh, bottom line, they're all high quality sources. You know, one thing to point out when you look at the report, there's surface water things, there's uh, surface water constituents and groundwater constituents. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the reason we do have so much redundancy and reliability, um, frankly, is because we have a lot of diversity of sources. And that really does play into the region and, and our agency as well, giving us the ability to pull in all these supplies as needed. And here's a little uh, just a snapshot for TVWD in 2019. Uh, that's the percent that we actually used from each source to supply our customer demands, i.e. you. So as you can see, you know, it's a uh, left to right, smaller scale, less than 1% of our supply. That still translates to about 300 million gallons a year that we store for that use in the ASR. So water quality sampling. Well, there's thousands of samples collected at the source from our Portland Water Bureau and JWC sources. Um, you know, source water sampling is extensive. It's broad. There's thousands of things that get that get collected that go into support and then working our way down into TVWD system. You know, we collect over 6,000 samples each year to make sure your water is safe to drink. Uh, that's 6,000, over 6,000 individual samples collected. Tens of thousands of analyses get performed each year on all those samples that we collect to make sure that each and every day, uh, as close as to 24-7 as, as possible, we can let you know that your water is safe to drink each and every time you turn your tap on. 
So with that, we're going to watch a little video here for a second. This is actually some of our field staff out collecting a sample and gives you an idea of the process that happens uh, each week um, when we go out and collect a variety of these samples. Looks like it doesn't want to play right now. Bear with me one second. So that's a time-lapse video. It does take us a bit longer to sample than just that. Um, there's a little bit more process, but that gives you a really good idea of, of the steps we take and how we go out and sample. Um, and just to point out, you know, we do this dozens of times a week, over 150 times each month um, at strategic points across our system. What does that mean? That actually means that for the vast majority of people, there is a monitoring site close to their home or business that we collect these samples from. So when we tell you or when folks ask us, is our water safe, this is one of the reasons why we can answer and, and let you know that, yes, we collect these samples um, and we can assure you water is safe based on the locations across our system. So just dive into the report um, this year. This is something we do every year and we will be doing more frequently in the future with these updates um, with our report. Um, the bottom line for this is that all the results this year and in many years past uh, are well below any level of concern. Um, again, your water is safe to drink. This is what we do. This is why we're here. This is why we're trying to make sure that everybody uh, understands the amount of time and effort that we're trying to, to do to make sure that we can, uh, we can ensure that with our customers. So um, we did a bit of a, a change in the report this year. Uh, we tried to kind of simplify it. Why is that? Well, because this report really tries to reflect the, re the regulatory sampling that we do. There's a lot of sampling that goes on across our system from staff even outside of our group. Um, and a lot of that, as we'll talk about here in just a sec, we're trying to build the website to increase that content so that it's more interactive for our customers. Simple questions you might have, complicated questions you might have, really trying to broaden that website and make it more interactive for our folks, while at the same time making all this, this data that comes from our source down to our through our system to try and consolidate that so it's a little bit easier to follow through. Um, and, and again, knowing that there's a lot of data that gets put in there in the first place. So that's kind of the goals that we set out with, with this year. We'll have some links at the end of this. If you haven't seen the report yet, um, we definitely want to make sure you get a chance to see, see this report and some of the ways that we've uh, structured it this year. And just before we dive into some of the report details, uh, a few key terms to keep in mind. Um, MCL, maximum contaminant level, MCLG, maximum contaminant level goal. Well, they sound similar, but they're slightly different. Um, the level is actually the regulatory limit uh, that, we're, that we adhere to. And the goal is, is really effectively what we would like to make sure that we could achieve if, if possible. Um, that goal is also about health, but it's less about the realities of what treatment techniques or things like that might, might involve in meeting the MCL level. So when you go to the report, you'll kind of see there's sometimes there's a difference between those two values. Um, milligrams per liter parts per million, um, that's a reference point for the amount of a constituent or contaminant in the water. Same thing with micrograms per liter parts per billion. Uh, a good little example that we often point out, um, one drop of water in a, an Olympic sized swimming pool translates to one part per billion. So I hope that gives you a sense of scale of of exactly when we report this information of how much a constituent might be present in the water that we're that we're serving you, and oftentimes you know those things do come from naturally occurring sources. And last, method detection limit. Um, that's effectively the laboratory method that that gets used in the lab. How low can we actually detect something based on that type of analysis? And then you'll see things like non-detect or less than the MDL. They're more or less the same thing in general terms. It's effectively saying, well, we didn't find anything using, again, that method detection limit. 
And then you'll see min max throughout the report. Min max is effectively the fact that we collect, we, TBWD and our partners collect data uh, throughout the entire year. So if you realize taking those samples, you know, oftentimes the sample is a snapshot in time. Well, we take a lot of those snapshots in time over the year. So that's why you'll see those ranges because that's all the sampling for that particular constituent that we did over the year. And that's why there's a range for that. So diving into the report, like we said, um, it kind of starts source, goes through our system to the customer's tap. So, you know, there's a lot on this screen. We're not going to go through all of it, but we kind of wanted to give some context around this. Um, I and mean, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of sampling that goes on at the source. Some of these things are naturally occurring elements, things like lead that can actually occur uh, and can, can show up based on the mineralogy, the geology of the area that our water comes from. Uh, the water cycle plays in that quite a bit. Things that happen from agricultural sources. You know, all those things are items that actually drive the information that we get. Um, and this is just a, a snapshot of the actual port itself. He said we weren't going to go into a ton of detail here. We, we kind of want to make sure we get to this um, and we can certainly revisit this stuff and ask any technical questions you, you might have in the end of this. And again, going to the report, additional source water data. Um, there's a variety of things that we look at from radiological constituents, uh, things that happen from the breakdown of naturally occurring radioactive materials and the geology. Uh, you'll see the kind of triptych of pictures up top there. Um, things that are impacts from storm events, things that impact the watershed itself, which are related to the turbidity, and then microbiological constituents, things that could obviously make us sick. Um, the big takeaway that I want to get out of this particular slide was just, you know, not only do we care about the health of the water that goes through our system after it's treated, we absolutely care about the water in the watershed itself. This is why we do this monitoring. Oftentimes prevention is the best measure. Prevention is the best type of treatment. Um, so that's really why we monitor this. Even though this isn't treated, these are the things that we really want to make sure we're aware of in, in our source water so that we can respond effectively to make sure that we're doing our best to protect those sources and treat what's needed. And then we move through our system. Um, these are types of things that we look for very frequently. We do a lot of operational changes in our system at times to make sure we're improving things like chlorine disinfection. We try and make sure that we do things more efficiently. We're actively working on those aspects right now. Things we could do to, to minimize uh, the formation of what are called disinfection byproducts. Uh, as the video pointed out earlier, we're out there frequently collecting these samples across our system to make sure there's no microbiological contaminants, things that could possibly get inside the pipes when we do main breaks. Um, we are very diligent. These are the examples of things that we look for and that we do to try and make sure that your water is safe to drink. Um, and, and just a little idea about what that testing process looks like in the uh, upper right hand corner too. And I should point out for this year, as you'll notice, um, we take a lot of samples, we do a lot of follow up. And again, it really does highlight the fact that your water is, is safe and we did not find any microbiological constituents that showed up after doing repeated sampling. And last, we'll, we'll at least end on the topic that I know a lot of folks um, share a lot of concerns with, as do we, which is lead and copper. This is a program that's been in place at the district and our partners for a very long time. Uh, within our region, it should point out that uh, lead, the primary source of lead related to water is from copper plumbing. Um, and those homes that were built in the late 70s to mid 80s, uh, those are the homes that were last, last installed with copper plumbing that used lead soldering before it was banned. So we have a pretty strategic monitoring program at TBWD uh, that actually takes a lot of participation from you, our customers. We have over 100 folks that participate in this program every year that help us collect the samples from their tap in their home um, to make sure that we can evaluate what's happening. Obviously, we don't control the lead uh, in somebody's home, but what we do try and work on is the corrosivity of our water and making treatments at the source and at the treatment uh, to try and improve that. Um, and again, I just want to point out that, you know, while we can't control that, we're here to help with this issue, educate. We do offer free lead testing for our customers. If you are interested or if you haven't taken part of that yet or take it, taken a part of that, um, taken part in that effort yet, we have some resources at the end that will show you about this, about this situation. So, um, but again, the takeaway we, we wanted to share from this is that we're actively engaged in this issue. We're here as a resource. If you have questions, we, we are absolutely committed to making sure that um, we do our best to try and mitigate this risk for people. 
So what's not included in the 2019 report? Well, non-regulated assessment sampling, things that I just briefly mentioned that we do a lot in our system, um, just assessing what's happening, taking a look at chlorine residual uh, in greater detail, temperature. There's a lot of things that we do that we don't necessarily include in this report, but we are happy to talk to you about. And we will we will gladly share any of that information with you, um, as some folks might know when they call us and ask us any kind of questions. Um, past monitoring for special contaminants uh, like PFAS and cyanotoxins. We do the, that type of sampling periodically. Um, they are actually available. That data are available on our website um, in various forms and also available if you call and talk to us about it. We've done that sampling, but again, this year is effectively a snapshot of 2019, so something that we do every year. So it's just not included in this particular report right now. Uh, what, what, is also, what is not included as well is TVWD's future Willamette River source uh, because, well, that's a future source um, and this particular uh, report is effectively looking at what we've done uh, in the past, this past year. And, and there's broader data available too that's not in this report. We put those resources on our website, uh, information that we want to share with you. We have key industrial customers that want to know a lot more. Uh, any of you or some of you out there that might be home brewers. Um, folks that just want to know information related to any particular type of constituent um, because they've read a report about it or some health-based information, that stuff, we have a lot of resources. That is what we're here for, um, and that information is available, and we're expanding a lot of that content on our website just to help, help get folks more interactive with it um, when you do have those questions. So, like we said, um, we just wanted to go through a quick snapshot of the report. Um, we didn't want to exhaust every line item despite my my desire to geek out as the rest of our team knows and talk about every single little uh, nuance of it. But that's what this part is for. So now it's your turn. Um, we are here to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Um, we hope that this was in informational right now. And again, um, that's the point where you get to take take charge and ask us questions about anything and anything under the sun. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Frank Reed so he can moderate uh, the session starting starting right now. All right. Hello, all right. Everyone. Hello, everyone. Once again, Once again thank, you thank you for, for joining, joining us. us. Oh, little echo little there. Echo that's there. all right. That's all right. Um, um, I am I'm moderating, moderating, moderating this session, session and, and if you're able to submit a question in the chat, chat, please do so. Now would be a great time to do it. And I will actually ask those questions in the order that they are received. Uh, for those of you who are on phones, you will have a chance to unmute and ask your question. Uh, for those of you using the Microsoft Teams, um, if you would like to raise the hand, then we will call on you and you can uh, ask your question. So with that, we actually got our first question from Jeffrey G. And the question is, how does our water quality compare with that from water quality around the country? Jeffrey, that's a good question. So um, we might be somewhat biased by this, but I will personally say that I think our water quality compares very favorably with the rest of the country. Um, in our region, we are, uh, for lack of a better term, blessed with a lot of really high quality sources, whether that's surface water or groundwater, um, partly just because of the geology of our area, partly because of the general nature of our watersheds. Um, even the watersheds we have that do have some more agricultural or influences from uh, uh, human influences, um, even those, you know, in general have a high degree of quality to them as well compared to the rest of the country. So um, examples that we might look at, you know, things in the Midwest or the South desert Southwest, you know, even though we all know that we're under the same regulations, just from an aesthetic standpoint too, you know, our region, our region doesn't have some of the same issues with an example might be high dissolved solids that can cause taste issues with your water. For those of you that may have been down south at any point, when I say south, you know, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, sometimes again, the water is absolutely safe, but at least aesthetically, um, there are key note, key differences when you when you visit some of those regions of our country. So uh, again, we're, we're lucky and we hope that the data shows it. And um, if there's anything else, specific questions by all means about constituents, we're here to answer those too. All right, thank you, Joel. So the next question that we have is actually from Carol, and she says she's been following the Environmental Working Group, uh, their work, their regulations, and some of the stuff that they've put out. And 
while TVWD meets federal regulations, it does not meet the regulations of the Environmental Working Group. So what has TVWD done to improve water quality to meet the Environmental Working Group regulations? So one thing I'd point out, so Environmental Working Group, oftentimes um, Environmental Working Group sets sort of guidelines that are end up being possibly more stringent than both our federal and our state guidelines. Um, you know, if there's a specific parameter you're interested in, um, I would love to have that conversation offline to give you some more uh, detailed information about it. We've seen our report for Environmental Working Group. We actually commented to Environmental Working Group. Um, we unfortunately didn't receive a response because we felt like there was information that, while it wasn't necessarily entirely inaccurate, it was somewhat misleading as far as the way that they were reporting that information. Um, a good example was disinfection byproducts. Um, even though our sources and throughout our system, the amount of sampling we do is very much in compliance, well below any level of concern, certainly well below uh, maximum contaminant levels. Uh, even in the environmental working groups information, it was somewhat, it was somewhat, uh, I will again, misleading the way that it represented that information. So um, it's not a regulatory requirement. We look at that frequently. Um, I hope that answer gives you some assurance. And if there is something specific that you actually want to know about within the report, um, at the end of that slide, please contact us and we will we will absolutely dive into those details and walk you through uh, whatever whatever particular information or constituent they're re they're referencing. And I, and I would point out too that you know the Environmental Working Group sent out quite a bit of information over the last several years about PFAS. You know, TVWD was one of the agencies, along with our partners in the region as well, that did that did quite a bit of sampling during some time period during about three to five years ago, um, where we didn't have uh, any any detections from that effort and that sampling. So, in the Northwest wasn't necessarily a, a spot where we saw a lot of that occurrence. So, even though the Environment, Environmental Working Group did highlight that there was concerns in our region, so there's just a bit of a balancing act there. And again. Um, you know more details if there's specific constituents that's what we want to talk to you about so let us know afterwards and we'll definitely dive into those details so joel there's actually a second part to carol's question oh. and what oh sorry that's okay uh one of the concerns is how a lot of these contaminants are actually being captured at um the proposed filtration station and what happens to them so they are not released back into the environment okay great yeah so i I wonder if that might be related to PFAS. That's, a ex that's an excellent question about that too, because frankly, it's a concern that we would share as well with some of those constituents, um, depending on what they are. You know, when we go through this report and we talk about it, you know, we do our best as water supply agencies to control and help protect our watersheds. So when you say filtration, I assume you mean source water. You know, unfortunately, there's some things that obviously we don't have as much control over. And with in regards to that particular issue, if it is PFAS, that's one of the issues that we've been actually advocating for at the federal level um, in regards to if those sources are out there in the environment and we know where those sources are coming from, then it shouldn't necessarily be the water providers that are, uh, are, are liable for that cost of that cleanup um, because of the very fact is like we don't always control that, but you're right, we are left with a potential need to deal with that issue if we have to treat it and decide where we put quote dispose of that. Um, again, in our region, that's not necessarily a high risk issue, but it's something we certainly think about in our treatment process. Um, it's something that when we deal with our treatment plans, we're constantly looking at uh, the way that we mitigate and the way that we deal with, with uh, the byproducts of the treatment process. So um, I hope that answers your question as best as possible. Um, you know, and again, if it is about that, I would love to have more of a detailed in-depth conversation about um, about PFAS themselves and and you know what we're looking at in our region and what we're thinking about for the future uh, of the area and our treatment processes. Great, Joel. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Jim D. And the question is: Do TVWD source waters have different levels of disinfection byproducts, and which source has the highest disinf disinfection byproducts in testing? So based on source, um, you know, disinfection byproducts ultimately start at when you begin treatment of that source. So obviously, you know, you raw water comes in, 
we go through a treatment process, we treat that water, and then we add disinfection, a residual to it as it leaves that plant. And that typically is when the majority of that formation, that potential formation might occur. So with regards to TBWD, do our sources have our sources higher than other ones? Uh, in small terms, you know, there's minor differences, um, but overall, not really. Um, those particular constituents, you know, we monitor them throughout the system because that's really where we want to look at them. DBPs are driven by things like the amount of organic material, the type of disinfection, and the type of time that it spends in the system. So when we look at those three things, we look at them across our entire system. Um, and the fact of the matter is, all those results are typically well below the MCL, um, and we don't see uh, we see minor differences, but nothing that constitutes a, a huge difference with one of those sources in terms of uh, disinfection byproduct formation. Um, if you look at the report, which I'm going to pull up right now, because we have that in our screen right here. So without going to presentation mode, you can actually see um, we aggregate this data and pull, pull it together to make sure that it's combined. That's the MCL, which if you can see my cursor right here, moving up and down, uh, THMs and HAAs, 80 and 60. And then we have what's called our LRAA, which is we basically look at those over time. And then we also have the single site uh, results, which that's why the kind of, we try to do a lot of breakdown of how this data works. So as you can see, um, you know, we have a highest single result of anywhere in this particular site, but when we look at it from a perspective of over time, um, because again, these are snapshots in time, and we know it's much more dynamic than that. And it's also seasonal in fact. So that's why we use this for what is actually effectively our compliance criteria too. If we had one that went above the MCL, that would definitely be something that we'd be concerned about. Um, but again, we just we try to highlight that that you know there's not one source that really stands out over the other, and this information is available uh, in the CCR report um, this year and every year for that matter. All right. So I have to apologize. I missed a question from Dwight S. Sometimes he's come at me a little quickly. Uh, Dwight's question was, "What additional regulation do you think should be legislated?" Um. So will you repeat the question for me just for one second about the legislation? Yeah, so what additional regulation do you think should be legislated? So um, oh. do I, I'm not sure if you mean actual reg regulation or if you mean constituents or if you meant both. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think I got it. So I think I think in just general, you know, with current the current nexus of information out there, the current um, particular topics, um, you know, two on the forefront right now. Uh, would be obviously PFAS. I think there's a lot of information about that right now. Um, you know, another one uh, that is in the news quite a bit over the last several years would be cyanotoxins. OHA actually does have that, but at a federal level, that's not the case. Um, you know, I, I think right now, honestly, I think uh, there's a process that happens at the federal level and it does take time. I, I do think that PFAS um, isn't there is something that I want to be really uh, mindful that we do it right, but I think that one is that is a particular constituent that does warrant um, federal regulation, and I know they're working through that. Um, outside of that group, again, cyanotoxins are something that in the state of Oregon that they are regulated at the state level. Uh, I would, you know, I would like to possibly see some broader legislation on the national level with that too, just because that's a long-term issue that a lot of us a lot of parts of the country are starting to see as well and just as a brief reminder of cyanotoxins um, those come from harmful algal blooms you know those particular uh, events do have an increase in frequency with impacts from um, climate change occurring so we are seeing that i think that's one that would definitely worth more of a federal framework to really tackle that and address that in broader broader terms great thank you so the next question is from Todd S. And Todd says, since 70% of our water supply comes from Portland and it is known that they have a required testing protocol for crypto cryptosporidium in Bull Run, does TVWD actually test for crypto in the in the water delivered from Portland? Uh, no, the answer is no, we do not. Um, that gets tested for at the source. Um, I should point out that, you know, Portland does a 
a very extensive amount of monitoring with that. Um, they are finding those uh, low level low level detections during certain periods of the year, oftentimes during wintertime events. But TBWD does not do additional testing for cryptosporidium within our system. Um, again, primarily because it's a source water situation. Um, and ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, you know, those occurrences are still quite low uh, in terms of overall detections. And just to make sure that we point out, you know, that again, there's a very large uh, frequency of sampling that occurs up in the Bull Run watershed for that. Um, so, yeah, the answer the answer right now at this point is that, that we do not do additional testing once it enters um, our system for that particular constituent. Great. So now would be a great time if anybody is actually on the phone or if you would like to unmute and ask your question. We would love to do that. If you still have questions, please type them in to the chat. Um, Oh, looks like uh, we have a hand up and Paula Carson, would you like to ask us your question? Hi, Paula. Hi, Ice. Can you explain what this PBOS or Pete Bod? I don't know that uh, term. PFOS. How yes. do you spell it? Uh, Polyfluoroalkyl al substances. Um, <laughs> yeah, so PFOS. It, it's a broad, uh, the short version of that is it's a it's a very wide chemical group um, of fluorine based compounds and they're they're effectively what are called surfactants. Um, they are chemicals and constituents that have a very, very difficult time breaking down the environment. They're very long lived um, and things like uh, non stick coating for pans, firefighting foams. Um, those are probably the more, those are the most common ones, especially firefighting foams that result in PFAS. But we say PFAS because it's a lot easier than constantly saying poly, uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances. And Paula, if you have questions or if you want to know, we would happily send you um, some resources after this if you're interested um, and kind of the current state of what's going on in that particular uh, with those constituents, if you'd like, just feel free to let us know. Was that the um, the chemical that was in that wa that movie, Dark Water? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Tracking you. It. Thank you. You got it. Okay. So, and again, you know, we pointed out that TVWD and a lot of a lot of, in fact, the majority of all the water providers in the region have done that testing over the last several years. Um, so. All right, thank you, Paula. Um, if, do, if you still have a question, great. If not, if you could put your hand down just so I could see if anybody else puts their hand up. Um, all right, thank you. So we actually got a, another a question from Dwight S. And it says, suppose your testing uncovers a sudden toxic situation. What is the emergency process that gets triggered here? Great oh, question. Yeah, that involves our communication team too. So. Um, so that's what we would consider to be an acute risk. The, you know, the majority of the driver behind that uh, for our routine day-to-day -day sampling would be um, microbiological risk, but that doesn't obviously preclude, preclude if we did discover something that was a cont chemical contaminant from a backflow incident. Um, our protocol would be immediate notification of our customers. Um, so we have a lot of process in place, processes already in place, uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, typically, we stand up, you know, depending on the scale of the event, um, we have a direct responsible charge. We have operators and staff and managers that automatically get engaged. We effectively start what's called an EOC, Emergency Operations Center. Um, these are actually steps that we, in, in certain flavors, we actually do that quite a bit, even if we have something that we feel like is maybe just uh, a good example is all that testing we do in the system. Occasionally, we do actually have a detection when we collect a bacteriological sample. Most of the time, if not all, it's usually just because uh, the sample station itself, something it's, you know, there's a really sensitive test. Even when we have one of those, we start that process um, just to make sure that we're prepared because the entire, the entire goal of that is to make sure you, the customers, get notified immediately. Um, so when I say immediately, what does that look like? Uh, pretty much that it's it would be within several hours of us discovering that and then confirming it is the key thing with a lot of those. Sometimes um, going back to this slide, if you see here on the top right hand corner, um, 
oftentimes when we collect certain samples for certainly for microbiological if it's an acute risk you know it does take us time to do a resample to confirm that could be 18 hours um, and under those circumstances within that once we get confirmation of that uh, we would absolutely begin that notification process to all our customers through mass media or this if it's a smaller size scale we'll leave door hangers on there um, but again you know i it, it's it's really again about confirmation of a sample to make sure that we can notify or make sure we can verify that in fact that is really truly valid so that we don't either a give you false information or delay information coming to you um, so that's kind of the balancing act that we have to play a little bit but uh, and again, if there's ever any kind of thing where we feel like immediately we would notify you uh, promptly. And Jill, this is Tom Hickman, the uh, CEO. Uh, I we would also, depending upon the situation, we would consider taking measures of isolating and flushing uh, if we could. If it was a situation where a contaminant got introduced to a section um that we knew was very serious uh, we would look to isolate and flush immediately as well as to notification that would go out yeah yeah absolutely yeah part of part of the part of the way that we would monitor and part of that is sort of an investigation that automatically kicks in for us too so as tom notes you know i hope the takeaway you get is we wouldn't we wouldn't be sitting around waiting we'd be taking every corrective action possible for our system and I'm going to jump in here for a little bit. So some of the way, some of the other ways that we notify is we email and we make phone calls to people that we have their information in our system. So if you if we don't have your correct information, if we have an old email address, we don't have your correct phone number, be sure to give us a call and update it so we can notify you in emergencies. Um, but we also do it through social media, through Twitter, Nextdoor, uh, Flash Alerts, um, Facebook. So we do our best to notify. We currently do not do it by text, but we're always looking into different tools, more tools. So definitely something that we are looking into. Yeah. Uh, the next, oh, uh, Paul R, his hand is up. So Paul, take it away. Yes, <clears throat> thanks for taking my question. I was wondering uh, for the uh, unregulated contaminants in the monitoring system, if you're looking at uh, different byproducts of pharmaceuticals, uh, particularly in uh, you know residual wastewater flows when you're uh, sample or when you're taking uh, you know intake flows from the uh, Willamette River. Um, so the answer answer to that is we've done that monitoring for all of our sources in the past. Um, you know at this particular point in time, uh, again looking at all those sources and specifically the Willamette too. You know we haven't seen anything that indicates that that is a high level risk. So what I will say and answer you directly is that that's actively something that uh, we're having a conversation about, about when the next step for us to do something like that might be. What I can tell you right now for certain too is that all of us as regional water providers will be doing additional unregulated monitoring uh, in the next two years. Oftentimes there's programs that happen every five years from both uh, federal and state level where we take a look and look at the highest the highest likely potential for some of those unregulated contaminants that might be occurring. Um, so we take a proactive step at that point and really try and take a look at those and see if there is that uh, information there. So, but yeah, absolutely, you are right. You know, that's something that our team thinks about a lot. Our program team, when we're talking about the treatment process for the Willamette that we're putting in place um, is very robust, but that doesn't mean that we want to negate the idea of doing uh, source water protection and or just making sure that we're monitoring that and doing our part to watch that and, and frankly working with our partners too. Uh, you know you mentioned you mentioned wastewater you know we are a partner with clean water services as well. Um, those are all things that we actively have a conversation with our partners about too and and um, make sure that we trust them to do they're doing their best to mitigate any of those issues as well. So we actually have a uh, current working group with some of the wastewater folks right now for PFAS as well. Just having that conversation and having coordinated uh, bi-monthly meetings about the strategies and things that we're doing to help mitigate those issues. Great. So Joel, we got another question from Carol in the chat. And the question is, so we've heard a lot about hacks, you know, most recently Twitter got hacked yesterday. What are some of the technological safeguards being made to protect our water system? Um, 
So I'll answer this one too. I think we're directly at the water system. I might actually, uh, I might start and I might, I might rely on somebody else to follow up too, but if we're talking about um, security of our water system, I see Tom's right in. So I'll start it and hand it off to Tom. Uh, we do have a lot of 24 seven continuous SCADA monitoring that we deploy to make sure that it's secure. Um, that gets monitored by our operations staff. Um, cybersecurity is another one that I know our teams are looking at extensively. Um, we have a fairly robust and uh, quite frankly, awesome IT group. So those are a couple examples of things we do. Um, I'll let Tom sort of field it from there and fill in the gaps and expand upon that. Yeah, so uh, cybersecurity is something we take very, very seriously. Um, we are constantly monitoring our uh, systems to for for any hacks, um, and uh, our IT system is very responsive to those events. Uh, the the more commonplace that we see it is probably where you're all most vulnerable is actually through kind of email systems. Uh, my last check with our IT systems, uh, our IT director, he was telling me that. Currently, we're basically um, keeping about 500 uh, attacks a day at bay. Um, so it's why we take it so serious because people are trying. And uh, so it is something we're constantly monitoring. We have software that's monitoring constantly. Um, we have a lot of security systems in place for how, how people can even access any of our systems including our own staff. Uh, so uh, it, we, we have as many uh, safeguards um, as we can put in place. Um, and we're constantly monitor monitoring the industry standard uh, and looking at what else do, do we need to be doing or should we be doing uh, to provide greater protection. So uh, it's, it's one of these things that now is, it's the norm. Uh, that we have to be vigilant and watching for. It's one of those issues we can never let our guard down on. And uh, it, your point is well taken that it, it's just, a, it's a constant vulnerability, a constant threat. And uh, the folks that are hacking these systems are very clever and they never, never seem to stop trying, um, unfortunately. So uh, we, we do our best to stay on top of it. It's a good question too, because at the, at the end of the day, you're absolutely. You're, I think you, what you're implying too is it, it does actually impact water quality. If we weren't secure and vigilant, vigilant about our system and the way we operate it, you know, there is a consequence to the water quality we serve you, which is you know something that we all think about every day. And uh, just so everybody knows, actually, our IT director is on with us. So uh, Tim Boylan, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add. I'll leave it up to you. No, I think Joel and Tom covered it very well. Uh, my name is Tim Boyle and I'm the IT Services Director. The only thing that I would add is, is we have a multi-layered security protocol that includes both physical as well as uh, cyber elements. So we're protecting access to the physical technologies as well as, as uh, cyber access to them. So uh, we're, we have a broad-based, multi-phased approach to make sure that we're covered regardless of the, the threat. Great, thanks everyone. So I wanna this, take this time to encourage you, keep the questions coming. Um, I don't have any questions in the queue, but I do have another question that we actually get quite a bit, and that's about lead. So I know you touched on lead, but Joel, do you wanna go a little bit more in depth about lead? Maybe talk about where it comes from, what we do to help mitigate it, just some of the things that we do about lead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like we pointed out, you know, we've had an active monitoring program for many, many years. Uh, in 2017, we actually expanded that program extensively. Um, we expanded both the time times of year we collect those samples and the amount of homes that we sample from. So even though we do know in our region that the, the majority of the risk that exists in our area is from those homes I mentioned from uh, at this point, roughly the late 70s up until 85, mid 85, um, because that was the last year that lead soldering was allowed to be used on copper plumbing. Um, so those are the homes that we've specifically targeted. Uh, what do I mean by targeted? Well, when we set up these monitoring programs, our staff, uh, no joke, have crawled under 
150 plus houses and worked with those homeowners to make sure that we actually identified houses that had true lead soldering, worked with the customers to help them understand how they could be part of this monitoring program to get us the best data set, the best data pool that we could come up with to really get a much bigger picture of what that looked like. Um, and you might be asking yourself, well, you know, that's obviously a home, you know, TVWD doesn't control the plumbing of the home, but what we do uh, have the ability to help adjust is the chemistry of the water. Well, that's why as water providers, that's the, that's the issue that we look at from that perspective. It's called corrosion control. You know, and TVWD right now is a partner in JDBC, uh, Joint Water Commission. Um, you know, they provide us high quality water along with the Portland Water Bureau. Um, and both of those agencies uh, make adjustments over the time to control the corrosivity of their water. Things like pH, um, those adjustments get made. Portland right now is actively doing a much uh, a more robust corrosion control project by 2023, where they will have implemented um, uh, advanced corrosion control for their source to help mitigate that. Our new source as well with the lamb in the plant um, will also have a very, very uh, robust approach to make sure we reduce the corrosivity of that. Um, and so that's kind of on the, the water quality treatment front that we do. And then on the outreach side, as I mentioned before, you know, we work with those homeowners, we do this monitoring, we, we display the information, uh, and then we try and do outreach with our customers, let them know that they have access to free lead testing for their home. We try and let people know that if you do come back with a high result based on you know the amount of time your water sits in your plumbing, because that's the key driver for lead corrosion, water constantly moving doesn't cause as much corrosion issues because it's moving. When your water sits in your home plumbing, that's when you might get that risk from you know exposure to the plumbing where it picks up that constituent, that lead. Um, so we give people a lot of key information about how they can mitigate those risks. So you know, get the testing done. Um, simple steps you can do to reduce that exposure, flushing your faucets, uh, you know, the first period of the morning when you get up before you consume the water, um, doing follow-up testing with that, um, other options for types of, again, if you, you know, a, a simple filter in your house. Um, those are all kind of the variety of options that we want to help people understand about how they do. And then quite frankly, TVWD uh, has done quite a, a bit of testing just throughout our system, just looking for any type of information that we could find. You know, to date, we've never found any lead lead service lines. That's a huge driver of a lot of information about lead across the country. Um, that's not the same issue in our region, though. Like we just pointed out, you know, really does reside a lot to do with a with a customer's home and that lead copper uh, copper plumbing with lead soldering. So, yeah. So there's a variety of things that we do to try and help that issue and mitigate it, both from a treatment perspective and just from a customer use perspective as well. So and. I should also add that we've actually done outreach with some of our schools too. Uh, when this issue was really coming up, we tried to really engage with a lot of child care providers on resources and tools and information they could use to help mitigate those risks as well. So it's kind of an all the above approach with that particular issue. All right, thank you, Joel. Um, and then one other question. So some, every once in a while we get calls from customers saying that their water is a little bit cloudy, maybe it's murky, it's slightly discolored, um, or even that it smells like chlorine. They could really smell that chlorine. What are yeah. some things that cause that? Oh. Um, <laughs> a variety of different things with that. So that's actually one of the reasons why uh, when we go back to the, uh, the middle of our presentation there, um, we're trying to put a lot more information on our website so people can find the answers to those those kind of questions. So discolored water, um, it can either be a, a, a source seasonal issue from, from one of our sources, like fall color. We let people know that that could be one issue from um, Portland source during the bull run, bull run watershed. Um, it could simply be operations in our system where we're, we're doing a main repair. You know, we'll flush the water off afterwards, but sometimes there can be some discoloration. It could be us flushing, which is why we have an active flushing program it's to make sure that we are, you know, operating the system and uh, removing any accumulated sediments that that accumulate in the pipe along the pipe walls. Um, uh, somebody opens up a hydrant or a fire that causes the same kind of situation. Um, those are some of the more common ones we would see in Oftentimes, if people call us and ask us, you know, the first thing we do is do a quick, uh, a, a, a quick uh, analysis of what's going on in the system, what are our operators doing, what's been happening out there, you know, and they follow a lot of standard operating procedures. 
Um, but again, you know, oftentimes that can cause some slight discoloration when that work is, is being performed. Um, yeah, and then taste and odor too with chlorine. You know, we add chlorine to the water for a very specific reason. Uh, all of us in this industry are, you know, somewhat water geeks, I'd say. So, you know, we, we point out that chlorination is one of the great advances of modern of the modern society. Obviously, you know, it, it prevents us from having contamination events inside of our system. Um, it is critical to public health, but that doesn't mean sometimes there isn't some off taste and odor with it. Oftentimes, contrary to popular belief, when we let people know that all of our testing that we do out there in the system, most of the time when people call us, it's actually a loss of chlorine that causes that taste and odor issue. Um, as the residual is falling, oftentimes that low usage and then even temperature, as temperature increases, you can taste it a little bit more. Um, we always try to let people know that, you know, your water is still safe to drink. There's some simple steps you can take um, to help mitigate that in your home, flush your pipes out, let it run till it's cold. And oftentimes if we ever get those calls and we feel like, hey, there's something else we can do, we'll go out and do strategic spot flushing. We'll do some, we'll do anything on our part to make sure that we can help alleviate that issue if at all possible. So, um, you know, aesthetic situations are oftentimes the ones that are, you know, take time to figure out what's going on. Uh, we encourage everybody, if you go through the website and you don't get your questions answered or you still need more, we encourage everybody to call us right away and let us know. You know, we want to know that information right away so we can take the right steps to make sure we know what's going on. Um, so again, don't ever hesitate to call or send us an email about it. Um, that way we can take a look at it and make sure everything is, you know, consistent with what we see in our system too. We take, we take every one of those calls seriously. I can assure you that. I'm going to put my staff on a pedestal and the rest of the TVWD staff, our customers, and those customer calls, every one of them gets taken seriously and everyone gets looked, every one of those gets looked into. All right. Thank you, Joel. So Stan G, you had your hand up. I saw you put it down. Would you like to ask your question still? Hey, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. OK, yes, good. We can uh, hear you. It had to, it's a short time here. Uh, we had, um, you had a source water assessment done in 2005, I think, for the, the regional facility on the upper Tualatin. And then in 2019, you had another. And I'm, I'm thinking it's good to think of those source water assessments and the value that they have and how they could be done differently, whether you saw something different or the approach was different this last time and what you found and also the role of DEQ in this process since you don't have authority to go out and stop polluters necessarily in that watershed for that treatment plant you know what's the role of DEQ and I just bring this up basically as as good questions because that's going to be a big concern for the Willamette River and the role of DEQ is going to be huge <laughs> and, and for you your role is going to be quite different I see it as a lot more interactive with DEQ and wanting DEQ well supported to do its job you know so did you learn anything from the two um, source assessments 2005 2019 are things better in that watershed as a result of that assessment what did you get out of it so i think stan hi stan so hi there couple, hey <laughs> hi joe nice to hear you um i think it's like nice a two-part question kind of so i'll take the first one and say that i can tell you in earnest in all sincerity we are building a relationship with deq right now um We've done a lot more communication with DEQ um, that's actually centering right now around cyanotoxins. Um, mm -hmm. But I hope that kind of answered your question that I, I do think you are, I think you're right. I think we need to have more of a strong relationship. And that's one of the things that we've been working on with a lot of uh, work groups with DEQ on how to address cyanohabs at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, actively a, a working group that I'm involved with. In fact, we're meeting uh, next week, believe it or not. <laughs> so, um, but to your broader point, yes, totally agree. That is something that I think will be really key in building that relationship. So 
Um, I think your answer is, is or I think your question and sort of your comment is spot on. Um, with regards to the second part of the question, what did we learn? Uh, well, I, I can tell you kind of the perspective in my time and tenure here at the district uh, about our watersheds, our water sources. You know, have we learned things have changed? Um, I don't, I don't know if it's quite that simple. I think what we keep continuing to learn is that these are dynamic watersheds. Uh, there's a lot of change that happens with land use and planning, no matter what. And I think what our partnerships and our uh, partnership agencies who actually manage some of that work have really learned is just continuing to be more robust in their monitoring programs, expanding those so that we have a better grasp and scope of when those risks are occurring. Um, of taking a lot of proactive measures. You know, our JWC partnership um, and City of Hillsborough staff have done a, a tremendous job of engaging and doing a lot more sampling effort in all those watersheds in the upper Tolton Basin and also proactively doing a lot to try and help mitigate some of those risks, um, streamside improvement projects, grant programs, um, again, more robust monitoring programs uh, in Hag Lake and Barney Reservoir. So. You know, aside from what I think other staff have learned, what I can tell you stand categorically is, you know, we're all learning more and more as we go on that how critical it is that we really engage in that source water effort to understand what's going on. Therefore, we can engage the right stakeholders. Yeah, good. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, at this time, I wanted to say we are definitely going to keep taking a few more questions and answer the questions. It is one o'clock though, so just at our allotted time. So we would love for you to stay on and keep asking us questions. If uh, if you do need to go, we completely understand. So um, so with that, jo uh, Joel, the next question is: Everyone is concerned with lead and copper, but do plastic pipes create any issues? From John K. Um, with plastic pipes. You know, what I would say, so TVWD doesn't use a lot of plastic pipe, but we do use it in limited applications. Um, like any material, there's advantages and disadvantages to that. You know, as far as leaching components in plastic pipes, you know, the research and information that, that we know of, that we've looked into, doesn't indicate there's anything with that. You know, but again, it really is also about the right application of the right materials in the right spot. Um, you know, plastic pipes are prone to hydrocarbons, things like that. At times, that's not, you know, that's not a, that's not a blanket statement that simply says that that'll be a problem, but it's just those are issues that we all know about and we look at. Um, but as far as leaching, let's say in a customer's home with if it's PVC or Wurzbo or that, you know, the more flexible stuff, um, we haven't seen anything that indicates that as long as it's installed correctly. That type of information or that that type of plumbing material, you know, the things that you don't want to do, obviously, is let it sit out in the sun exposed to UV light where you could degrade and leach compounds. Um, but again, uh, you know, all the industry information that we look at and that we see doesn't show that, you know, in the right application, there's not the same risks with that. So. And uh, Joel, if I could add again, this is Tom yeah. Hickman, CEO. Uh, one of the things um, that we would suggest is make sure if you're doing plumbing in your home and you're using any kind of plastic pipe materials, um, follow plumbing code uh, using the industry standard. Don't just go down to uh, Home Depot and buy uh, your irrigation variety uh, pipe to do your plumbing with. Um, and then the, the as Joel mentioned, the the plastic pipe that we do use on a limited basis in our system um, it is industry standard approved so it's rigorously tested uh, and for you know what it's uh, what it's good for but as far as it shedding anything um, none that I'm aware of there's no reports out there that I am aware of but the other piece I, I thought to just add on to this uh, is the concern over microplastics now, um, that's that's a bigger concern about microplastics entering our source water. So Joel, can you can you speak to how our treatment systems address that, remove that, and detect that? Yeah, that's kind of at the forefront of a lot of the emerging technology and research right now. Um, and several of like the more recent literature papers and research projects we've seen, um, you know, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a one size fits all kind of answer, unfortunately. Um, part of that, as Tom knows, is like we're still debating what defines microplastic. <laughs> the micro part 
we know what plastic is, but what means micro in terms of plastic particulates? So, you know, typical typical types of filtration processes will remove a lot of that. Um, and, and obviously, the, at some point, at some incredibly small molecular level, that becomes the situation where a lot of research is trying to look at. You know, the treatment the treatment trains we have in place will effectively, from what we've seen so far, will remove the vast majority of that. Uh, and I, you know, just to sort of pivot the conversation too, this is the same thing we say all the time, which is there's always a risk of any of any type of contaminant out there. Some of the stuff we know now, some of the stuff we don't know. Oftentimes in our industry, we do this research through our, you know, our industry channels. Um, and oftentimes what we always end up concluding is like the best method is to try and prevent that in the first place. That's easier said than done. We all realize that. But at the end of the day, that often can be the best approach to some of those challenging issues that we're trying to face. So it's a it's an emerging concern. It's a really, really quite new topic in terms of like water treatment as well. Um, but again, I just I would like to assure people that, you know, the treatment trains that we have in place um, are effective. And again, how effective that's also information that we're still it's still being researched right now. In fact, I went to a conference last year and uh, yeah, there were several hundred people in the room for this particular session about microplastics on the Great Lakes. And it was incredibly fascinating to figure out, you know, how they're even doing the analysis to determine what what types of microplastics are showing up. So, you know, I'd say don't let your don't let pieces of plastic end up in the environment if you can help it. <laughs> so, yes. Great. Thanks, Joel. Uh, next question is from Jim M. And he says he's a big supporter of chlorinated water and protecting public health. But once chlorinated water is delivered to his house, shouldn't he remove the chlorine before drinking it? So pools and hot tubs are considered sanitized if they have one part per million or more. So would tap water be sanitizing good gut bacteria? Um, typically what we'd say about that, you know, if it's if it's the optimal dose that we want to see in the home, I mean, all the available public health information um, sort of supports the idea that, uh, you know, that is the most critical thing that we can do to make sure that your water is delivered safe, whether or not it is uh, causing something with your gut health. Um, you know, ultimately that would probably be something to consult with your doctor on. We don't have, I don't have any research that shows that that's really a risk or mitigation, uh, or sorry, that's really a risk or something that you need to be concerned about. Um, again, you know, we would try really hard to make sure that it's at the optimal level throughout our system. So, you know, and again, trying to kind of make that, that statement about the fact that Yes, while we understand our customers ask, often ask us that question and we don't shy away from the fact of like, yeah, I mean, in some perfect world, it would be ideal not to use it. But again, over the last hundred years, it's been one of the single biggest advancements that's allowed us to have safe uh, safety for public health in our communities. So it's pretty instrumental to making sure that we continue to meet that that mandate. Great. Thank you, Joel. Um, and with that, I think uh, I want to say thanks to everyone for all these great questions, and I would like to turn it back over to Tom again. Oh, Tom's on mute. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> um, and and thank you, Frank, uh, for moderating this um, and. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to say the annual water uh, water quality report summarizes the sampling program from the prior year, uh, but it truly represents the dedication of dozens of water professionals uh, and their ongoing commitment to delivering quality, safe drinking water to you. So uh, we have uh, phenomenal staff that are involved uh, that work with uh, a lot of partner agencies on the state and federal level to ensure that we are providing safe, reliable drinking water um, every day, 24 hours a day. Um, you will receive a short five minute survey about the event in the next 24 hours. Um, and we ask uh, for your feedback. It'll help us offer meaningful topics in the future and adjust any programming we do with the environment, uh, with the virtual environment. Um, this is new for us uh, to do these kind of virtual things, but we feel like it might be a good thing to do in the future on a number of topics. 
so we welcome your feedback as well as what are the other things that you're interested in hearing about? Um, we have many ideas of what we'd like to bring to uh, this format, uh, including some of the the day to day maintenance work that we do um, so that people understand you know, when you see somebody out there flushing a hydrant. Why are we out there flushing a hydrant when they're out there um, working on your meter box? What are they doing in there? So those kinds of things we'd like to be able to bring to you. Uh, but like to hear from you what your interests are uh, and what you'd like to know more about. Um, this event was recorded and it will be available on uh, the TVWD YouTube channel. And uh, we really want to on off thank you for your time today in advance for, of your feedback. Uh, and uh, just really appreciate being able to connect with you in this virtual envir environment. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you all. And my only closing statement is, if you have follow-up questions or want to know more, please email us and call us so we can geek out together. <laughs> so yes, please don't hesitate. We love these kind of questions and we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you.